Too often, we often look at violence and the outcome of violence at the end of it as being, that was undeserved. And when there's chances to walk away, I'm not saying you just shouldn't do that. But equally, when someone's in your space, when there's a physical threat that's already been intimated, when actions have been initiated by an individual who's gonna go, you're often left with no choice. In an age where things seem to be getting increasingly violent and man's life, a fellow man, seems to be in an all-time thin point, the martial arts are often seen as a thing that people are going to be turning to to solve the problems. With so much information out there, we've never had greater access to what is out there for martial arts. The good, the bad, <laughs> and sometimes the ugly. But so many of these things are so busy selling you the school, selling you their style, selling you what they do to solve your problems, they overlook the biggest aspect of it, which is the legal, the ethical, and the moral aspects of things. Hi, I'm Jay Cooper, and this is your reality check. So the first thing we're gonna be looking at today is a case study of one that's been doing around recently. Um, this was in London, a famous boxer called Julius Francis. Well, certainly he was famous in England. For those outside of you, he's more famous for getting knocked out by Mike Tyson with a newspaper sponsor in his shoes. Um, but he's since turned into door security work. And there was a video that went viral of his encounter with several people of a less than friendly disposition towards him and his fellow door staff. One of the things that most people have picked up on this is the final piece. That's when this individual goes up to Julius and pop, all of a sudden he's having a good sleep. Now, I'm not saying what was right and what was wrong at this point of things from a technical perspective. I mean, the fact that the guy was unconscious is normally a good sign that that was a good thing to do. What I am going to start to get into, though, is a little more of the understanding as to what led up to this decision point, why this shot was thrown, and why it was right to throw that shot. Most people have picked up on the fact that the gentleman was approaching aggressively, his arms were in the air all splayed, and then it went bang, that one's right on the chin. But like so many other things, any iceberg has so much more below the surface, and almost everyone that's done an analysis on this video has missed it. These are the gaps that I'm hoping to fill in today. So as soon as this video is starting, we already find out that we have an individual in medias res, so to speak. For those of you with a non-classical education, that means in the middle of things. This gentleman wearing the old blue do-rag is certainly expressing what we should say this is dissatisfaction with the door staff and the general way they're handling it. Now, there's a gentleman interacting with in a white shirt, but if you listen to the vocals and the way his eye line is going off, this isn't the man he's got the problem with. The man he's got the problem with, and so many people miss this, is actually Julius. At the beginning, this started with Julius, and it ends with Julius. The fact people miss this is sometimes telling, because the bit they see is that shiny piece at the end, when the poof goes on the jaw. All the stuff that led up to that, the behaviors, the trigger points, and the things that are gonna show someone why this person needs taken out, or otherwise, are all told and laid out here. The language being used is certainly of the salty variety. The gentleman with the white shirt in front of him is a tall guy, relatively well built. He's certainly not what you could describe as a fat cunt. Julius, on the other hand, lovely guy though he is, hell of a right hand though he has, has put on a few pounds since his boxing days. So if I was gonna use such an epithet, it would probably apply more accurately to him than the other guy. If you watch the eye line as well, this is clearly who he's addressing all his frustration and his anger to at this moment in time, whilst he's being escorted off the premises. Now, this is important as well, and this got missed on almost everything. If you watch, while he is talking, at the conclusion of his outburst, his sentence, his insults, he does something telling. He does a little pause and he spits, and almost everyone has missed this. He's spitting at Francis. It wasn't a globule, it wasn't like it's was gonna be landed and rolling down his face. But already, you can see the venom that this guy's putting forth. Spitting is a very primal act. So the anger, the rage that this guy's got is expressing itself viscerally and it's coming out right at Julius. The fact people miss this is actually telling because when you watch at the encounter as it's spilling forward, there's a belief that the encounter and this anger is all at the other staff and Julius is off to the side. This is because you're not tracking and they're not seeing what's going on. This man is one of a pack. In street situations, in urban combat situations, the one-on-one -on -one fight, the ego match, it's an increasingly rare thing. Most social violence, which is what this is, is a basically a dick measuring contest. You might as well go piss up a tree and claim it as yours because that's about as much validity as these things have. They're not fighting for turf, they're not fighting for life, they're not fighting for property, they're fighting for someone that's put a perceived slight or insult on them. 
whether you're a scorer from the premises, whether you've said something about their trainers, or whether you support a different football team. We try not to get into the mindset of idiocy of this level. You just have to deal with it when it's in front of you. But if you look at all the people that are hanging on with him as well, he's got his little entourage of beakers. He's got his little entourage of shouters. He's clearly the head. He's clearly the mouthpiece of this. These guys are the more dangerous ones. The reason being, because they're leading, they dictate what happens and where this goes. At any point in this situation, had this guy kicked off directly, the others would have swamped with him. When he goes outside to Julius at the end, that's the only time when there's an isolation piece. This is important too, because everything prior to this has been behind barriers, has been in a crowd, and has been, come on, along we go, let's move ourselves along. This isn't a situation where someone's going to throw a clean shot or build themselves up to it. When it gets to that clear free space, all of a sudden now, he has his arena, he has a single opponent who, let's not forget, was the one he was focused on at the beginning. Because he was focused on him at the beginning, it makes sense he's focused on him at the end. So when you look at the continuation of the story, starts here with the anger, ends here with the anger. This is going to go, and this is going to go bad. So Julius's decision to throw that punch makes much more sense within that context. One of the things you also need to be conscious of here when you're looking at these people is how badly they're actually hiding their adrenaline. The fight, flight, or freeze aspect of any combat situation is inherent to us as a species and pretty much every animal that's out there. You're either going to put them up, you're going to turn and run, or you're going to stand still. That's it. What this guy's doing here is he's trying to reach his decision point. Adrenaline, when it's coursing through your body, does several really weird things to you. Nervous tics, splaying of the arms, all this stuff that you see guys do. Yeah, and what? And what? That's all adrenaline going somewhere. He's wanting to engage physically with someone. He's wanting to have this fight, but he lacks the courage to take that first shot initially. That's why he's spitting. That's why he's shouting. That's why he's using that inflammatory language. He wants them to start to give him that reason and that excuse to go. The fight is in him but also is the flight, and he's trying very hard to balance this chemical cocktail that's going around in his system. When you look at the other guys that are working within here as well with him, they're generally hanging around him, supporting him, the little rooks on the corner of the chessboard for the king. Only when one of them is touched does he then start to become a little volatile himself. Shrugs, get off me, don't touch me, don't touch me. Very clear singular directions. Again, trying to give that justification for when the violence inevitably happens, Hey, I set my parameters, you engaged in my parameters, therefore the fight's perfectly legal. Even though these people are cautious of being caught in trouble, they're not afraid to have a fight either. It's a very fine balancing point between the legal and their own personal morality. They feel aggrieved, they think they're going to fight, but they also know this isn't a good thing to be doing because the law doesn't look kindly on that sort of thing, especially when it's to do stuff. So they're trying to find that justification point in their own head. Julius, rather sensibly, extracts himself from the initial affray while the people are being removed from the premises and actually skirts round to the outside. He isolates himself so that the people can be moved on calmly. When they move out from the security area and they then go to where Julius is stood, that's a choice to directly approach someone. That decision to directly approach him and then raise your hands as you get towards him, coupled with all those other bits and pieces that have gone before, is why he ended up having a short nap on the concrete. One of the things in self-defense that is often talked about is duty to run away, duty to retreat in the US, the stand your ground, castle doctrine, all these sorts of things that go along to it. Let me be clear, and this is a very common misunderstanding, you do not have to wait to be attacked before you can actually respond to someone with a caveat that you can't just punch someone in the face on the off chance they're going to attack you. Their behavior, which is a bounce of subjective and objective measures, certainly specific to you, will dictate whether you're going to get physical with them or not. So removing yourself from a situation, walking away, going away to somewhere safer, that's always a sensible option for a member of the public. But let's not forget Julius here isn't a member of the public. His paradigm right now is the security and safety of the patrons in that premises. He has a job to do. His job to do is to make sure it's safe, the people there are safe, he and his fellow doormen are safe, and the last resort, the Nimrods that are currently running their dick lickers are safe. The problem with this is, it instantly causes those frustration and stress points. The guy with the camera, when the guy gets dropped, and rightfully so, bro, bro, no need for that, bro, no need for that, bro. There was every need for that. If you don't want to get punched in the face, don't approach a 320 pound ex heavyweight boxing champion and then raise your fist and start fronting him. Don't spit at him. Don't call him a fat cunt. Too often, we often look at violence and the outcome of violence at the end of it 
as being, that was undeserved. And when there's chances to walk away, I'm not saying you just shouldn't do that. But equally, when someone's in your space, when there's a physical threat that's already been intimated, when actions have been initiated by an individual that's gonna go, you're often left with no choice. What's he gonna do, go home to avoid this confrontation? Lose his job, lose his livelihood, lose his flat, lose everything else? Of course he's not, he's still got his job to do. He removed himself, these individuals had that chance to move away. They had that chance to go away. They chose, they chose to continue and press what was originally an assault with the spitting, the language and the pushing, and they chose to go one step further and step right into the personal space. And they then paid that price for that. Good night, Vienna. So obviously this has been a very, very short summary of a very, very complicated scenario. I could lecture and indeed have lectured for hours on these videos. If you're interested in finding out more or finding out how you can actually get into the iceberg and the underneath parts of the self-defense situations, then please do join me on Facebook at Aftermath, the fight after the fight. So I hope you enjoyed this short video. Please do smash that subscribe button. I hope you liked the video. Please feel free to share it on any social media platforms that you have. This is the first of many, and I look forward to seeing you all soon.